Welcome to my talk about working with Qt Quick and Python on a real life robotics project. So I run a small um, software consulting company called Machine Coder, which is uh, focused on HMI development for industrial machines, robots, and tool machines, or machine tools, actually. And uh, today I'm going to uh, explain you my experiences or talk about my experiences working on a real life project uh, with actually with Qt Quick and Python. So who of you is actually already using uh, Python uh, in combination with Qt? Okay, one person. And who of you is interested in using uh, Python and Qt? Okay, I guess that's why you're here. So first of all, I'm going to explain why, what's my story actually, why I uh, went from C++ to Python, or why actually we're using C++, uh, Python in this actual project. Then I'm going to talk about a little bit about project structure and the workflow in this particular case, because that's a little bit different than a usual uh, cute C++ uh, project. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about quality assurance and the issues that are actually found when working with uh, Qt and Python. Last but not least, I'm going to give you my conclusion uh, whether I like Python and Qt in combination or not. And yeah, you can. So it started all out uh, a long, long time ago, uh, so approximately a little bit more than 10 years. I was working with Delphi, and I was uh, working with Windows Vista, and I was really not uh, um, satisfied with Windows Vista. A lot of people, you, of, uh, you probably can know why. And then I uh, switched over to Linux, and that's why I actually started working with Qt and C++. And since I liked uh, KDE a lot, I actually liked the visual appearance or the eye candy that uh, Vista provided, and so I switched to KDE. And that's why I started with Qt and C++. So at this point, this was no, uh, no thinking. I, I don't actually thought about using Python at all. Uh, but a little bit later, I went, uh, actually got confronted with open source software. In particular, a project called Machine Kit. And that's also the cause of why my company, or actually my consulting company, is called Machine Coder. Uh, so Machine Kit is an open source software um, which is focused on motion control. Uh, it's used for CNC machines, it's used for 3D printers, and now also for uh, robots. And at, uh, Machine Kit actually had some user interfaces. It's a fork of Linux CNC, and it has user interfaces or had user interfaces pay, based on uh, TKinter, which is actually a Python uh, supported graphics framework, and you probably already know it's not looking very nice, and uh, it's actually uh, very ugly, and it's, uh, to work with this uh, user interface framework is not very really nice. So I thought, well, I already knew a new Qt, and I already knew C++, why not switch over to Qt Quick VCP? Uh, actually, switch over to Qt and Qt Quick. And so I started a project called Qt Quick VCP, and this, at this point, actually already thought about using Qt and Python because I was exploring Python at this time. Uh, this was like six years ago or so. Uh, but there was one big problem, and this was the cross-platform support. And in uh, addition to that, I had some other objections. For example, I, I thought, well, Python is good for small scripts, but it's not really useful for big, uh, creating bigger applications. Uh, people say it's slow. Uh, I thought it's not really safe to use it because uh, it uses duck typing. It's, uh, at runtime, you can have some kind of runtime errors. You can have all sorts of errors you can't catch when uh, actually writing the code. And I thought it's actually just useful for prototyping only. And so I stayed away from Python at this point. But the most important case uh, problem was actually it does not support uh, mobile OS very well, or at least in combination with Qt. But a couple of years uh, later, uh, one of my customers called Tormach. Uh, Tormach is a machine tool manufacturer based in the United States. And their focus is basically affordable CNC machines. So machines uh, in the, in the, more in the lower price range, but uh, targeted for uh, enthusiasts or semi uh, small professional companies, like small machine shops, like three, four, five uh, people. 
And the focus of their user interface or the um, user interface for their machines is actually to be very easy to use because usually this kind of people that work with these machines are not trained uh, professional CNC operators. So they have probably no or less experience with uh, CNCs uh, before uh, getting their first Tomah machine. So it's very important for them to make the user interface very user friendly, very easy to use. And Last year, uh, they had the idea, why not uh, extend the uh, product palette by a robot? So we already have very easy to use uh, CNC machines. Why not add an easy to use robot? Because like the small machine shops were actually uh, starting to ask for uh, products like that for small serious production and so on. And then this company, the previous user interface is based on GTK2. There's one big problem with GTK2, it's not, uh, it's not supported in the future, so you either have to move to GTK3 if you like GTK. I personally don't, uh, but yeah. Uh, and you have, uh, and they're already using Python in their company, so they actually already have experience with Python. So we are starting and thinking about this new project, and we already had experience with Python, and there was this break we had to do anyways. We, did, we needed to switch from GTK away to something else. So we uh, thought, well, let's give Qt a try, uh, and Qt in combination with Python actually a try. So uh, for this robot project, we are using ROS Industrial, and uh, there is a Python interface for ROS called ROSPy, which is pretty simple to use. Um, if you are using ROS, you have the choice either use C++ or Python. You can also use some other programming languages, but those are the two main uh, supported programming languages if you want to work with ROS. Arvis is the graphical um, visualization and interaction um, framework or, or tool uh, that you can work with in ROS, and we also thought it might be a good idea to integrate that in our Qt Quick application. And so we actually tried it out. And it turned out, well, it works actually pretty well, uh, surprisingly well. So we did not switch over to Qt C++. We were thinking about, in the beginning, why well, just try Qt C++, but then we are uh, rethinking it, and, and actually we choose Python. And here are a couple of reasons um, I discovered when working with Python itself. So first of all, very click, uh, I mean, lines of code is not a good me measure for, uh, for choosing a programming language, but in this case, it's also, uh, may be useful because um, more lines of code or more code itself uh, is harder to maintain. You have to, in C++, you have at least twice times as much of code because you have header and source file. Uh, I think some people say it's five times as much co uh, code, but if you're working with Qt, Qt supports, uh, has a lot, brings a lot of features with itself that's uh, besides graphical uh, user interface features. So it's approximately three times as much code, two to three times. Uh, but the really big difference is development speed. So with Python, Python, as I already mentioned, I was thinking about Python using uh, for, for prototyping, but it's actually also great for normal development. Uh, one thing, uh, there are like a few reasons for that. First of all, it has very extensive standard libraries, so it can do almost everything you think of, uh, can already be supported with standard libraries, at least a lot more than in C++, even when comparing it with Qt uh, and C++. But um, another huge uh, advantage is actually uh, that the language itself supports more features, not only standard libraries, but also things like um, the collections and things like that, or working with slices and things like that. I mean, C++ is getting more, more modern, and, and C++ 14, 17, 20, and so on is adding a lot of these features, but still Python is, in my opinion, and from my experience, a lot uh, faster to work with. Popularity is a, f a small factor, it's a, a, a factor uh, that's actually, C++ is also growing in general in uh, pop popularity when it comes to programming languages. Might be a good, fa uh, might be interesting for you if you're running a business. Uh, probably find more Python developers than C++ developers. I'm not sure if you find more Qt and Python developers, uh, where I have to look. Uh, Cross-platform support is a little bit better for C++ and especially for Qt C++ because everything is supported out of the box. Uh, quality assurance, in my opinion, is a little bit better with Qt and C++ because you have the compiler, which already uh, will 
catch a lot of errors you can make when working with a software. Testing, in my opinion, is better than with Python because you have the duck typing, you need, don't need to recompile, and it's a lot easier to work due to desk-driven development. Performance, uh, in my opinion, not as a much as a big factor when you're working with user interfaces because most of the time your user interface is idle and waiting for user input. Uh, so it's, if you are making some, uh, an application that's focused on uh, computation and so on, you might consider using C++. And a little bit of downside is features and bugs. Of course, the Python uh, uh, wrappers actually wraps the uh, cute C++ library, so it's actually the Python bugs on top of C++. Uh, yeah. But the one thing, uh, actually, when you're uh, starting out with Python and C++ is there's PyQt and there's Qt for Python now. And you might think uh, why there are two, uh, actually two bindings. And short and simple answer, you can compare this to, uh, those two bindings and the features. But short and simple answer, user wrapper. Actually, we are using Python Qt binding, which uh, abstracts both PyQt and Qt for Python. So you can still choose which uh, Python binds you, you actually want to use. QtPy is very popular outside of ROS. Python Qt binding is coming from ROS. And we have very good experience with, with that. The abstraction, uh, like the API, is compatible between PyQt and Qt for Python. So Qt for Python is designed to be API compatible with PyQt itself. So it's actually pretty simple to use uh, a wrapper. Next, uh, I'm going to explain a little bit what the actual project structure looks like. So this is not only focused on, on, on the uh, Python itself, but maybe also when you're working with a bigger application. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm using live coding, and I will explain this a little bit later. So ha we have two entry points to the application. One is the init uh, or main file. Init is just for the splash screen. Main QML file is the actual top level QML file. And we have the live QML file, which is the same, but for live coding. And then there's the main.py file, which would be similar to your main C++ file. It's basically your entry point for your C++ uh, Qt application. Um, and when we take a look at the actual uh, project structure, you will see um, we have the controls, which is very similar to actually um, talking a little bit later about that. But we have the control, controls, with, which are generic um, user interface controls, like buttons uh, with a special style, with special features, and so on. Uh, we have a development uh, folder, which is just for live coding and, and the support files. Uh, we have, um, we have panels and screens. Screens, there's currently only just main screen because we have a single screen and a lot of panels. Um, and the most important thing are the handles, which I'm going to talk about uh, in shortly. But when working with Qt and Py uh, Python and Qt together, or Qt Quick and Python actually uh, and Qt together, I found out it's actually very useful since both are uh, scripting languages, they actually mix very well together. So I, I really like to have them in one folder structure. So if the Python uh, files into the same folder as the QML files when they belong to the same, same uh, QML uh, module. So we have here a QML dir file and we have an init.py file. Init.py is for, for Python, it's for Python modules. And in this case, also for a QML module, which is implemented by a Python model. And we have a QML file, which is for QML models, uh, modules. And C++, of course, if you're just working with Qt and Python, you can still have C++ uh, QML models. You just import them in your QML uh, files, which is very useful when you have uh, some external QML models or if you are having something that really uh, perform and needs some kind of performance or if there's a library that's just supported from Qt C++. But uh, what I'm also a little bit, uh, want to explain a little bit is uh, it's pretty easy and straightforward to design small applications like this roulette application here uh, with QML, but there's little that covers how to scale up, how to uh, make a more complex user interface uh, with QML in the Qt documentations. I first heard about like uh, things how to do, for example, how to make your styling uh, globally accessible, how to work with your phones and things like that uh, around QtCon 2016. Unfortunately, this was a talk which is not recorded, so it was in like a small room, and I 
can't remember the name of the talk anymore, but this was the first time I actually discovered how to work with, with bigger applications. And recently there was the, Nep, uh, the Neptune Free user interface, which comes with the Qt uh, automated motive suit uh, was released, which actually is a pretty good uh, ex example of how to make a, uh, an application that re uh, where you can scale up, um, where you can make a more complex user interface and still uh, being able to handle the, the complexity of the different elements. So this is actually what the architecture looks like. I mean, it's now uh, no um, UML chart. It's more like uh, a little bit more this. Um, that diagram is more a little bit uh, descriptive, so to speak. Uh, so we have the main entry file, which I explained uh, beforehand, and we have a top level file. So this is just for, uh, for live coding. If you have an uh, application which don't use live coding, uh, you will uh, have this both together. And then I have, uh, we have panels and views. Views actually represent, are actually views for, for your models, which are either stored in your handler or um, can be in your panels as well, depending on what kind of models there are. And then you have the controls, which I explained early on. These are buttons, uh, custom lists, and so on. And the important thing is actually that we have just a single communication point with our backend. Or actually, the, the communication is uh, happening from your handler and not from your actual QML component, which makes it possible to, to uh, get, wrap, uh, wrap your head around uh, your, the complexity of a declarative uh, user interface, so to speak. So why do we need that? Uh, one example here is a file system browser. File system browser just represents your file system. So you have as input, or basically the user selects your file, uh, a folder, for, for example, and you just want to view the f contents of this folder. For this uh, particular case, I wouldn't use a handler, because here we have just a file system model, a file system view, and maybe a panel called file system browser, or maybe it's a, a view element. And it's very useful uh, to, to keep them together because you want to reuse this and some more parts of your application. And it's actually straightforward to do. But now we have things like that. If you have a more complex applications, you might have similar elements, first of all, which is, of course, if they're just visual, it's just like a, another component. But if they have the similar state or if they should have represent a similar state, uh, you actually would have to have like uh, two models which uh, communicate with your backend, um, and you're doing the same thing two times as in your user interface, which of course uh, costs more resources and it's harder to uh, to work with that. And if you have more elements, like say this speed slider here, for example, or this button here, and it uh, wants to change uh, some value in your uh, in your backend, um, then you ha would have to have another access to your data. And to make this simpler, the uh, Neptune Free UI has something called stores. I call it handlers. It's just a uh, naming difference. But basically, you have your backend, your communication with your backend. In this case, it's ROS. Uh, inside these handlers, and you're accessing them uh, from your panels. In this case, uh, we have, I call it digital readout, what, what you saw before this. Uh, current positions of the robot arm, and we're accessing them via reference. So the Neptune Free UI does it exactly the opposite. So you're, it passes down the reference uh, to all the children. I find uh, it, this kind of um, redundant. You have to do it uh, quite a lot of times. And also, if you're using live coding, uh, you may just want to code the center panel, for example, and at your whole application. So it's a lot harder uh, to work with. And the, the big uh, good thing about that is you get a really consistent state in your whole user interface. So if you have two digital readouts or have something like where a user has some input, let's say a program uh, which you want to modify, uh, you have, can have the same, same state handler where you have the state of your user interface uh, or whatever you might call this handler. But uh, basically, you have the same state and you don't uh, need to think about how, how to have multiple access points to your backend. It's just one access point here. Yeah, so next thing I want to talk about is actually how to work or how uh, we work in this project with Qt, Quick, and Python. So first of all, I'm using live coding. I, uh, who is actually using live coding or something like live redoting already in the application? No? 
okay? Uh, live coding was invented or actually introduced a couple of years ago. Um, there was an application called QML Live Bench. Uh, it's already in the, in the Qt uh, applications. I think it's called Qt Apps QML Live Bench or something like that. Uh, I recommend you to check it out. Uh, for Python, I've also created something very similar. Uh, but basically, the idea is that you have uh, in your user interface um, and, and reload, like basically you're really loading your graphical part of the user in, uh, interface while you're coding. So working, uh, you're modifying the source code of your application and then your user interface updates, which can, uh, creates very short feedback loops. So you can work with the code, prototype, and see the updates instantly. I think, in my opinion, it's a really great way to work uh, with user interfaces in general. I also like to work this way with Python, but with Python I use something different, which I will explain in the next uh, section. And for the code editor, Qt Create does a really great IDE, uh, IDE for C++, but unfortunately the Python support right now is very limited. It's mostly syntax right now. If you want to do something like testing or uh, running tests with Qt Create, that will not work. Um, the QML support is, uh, is really great. So that's a huge advantage, actually. And if you want to use the graphical QML editor, then also use Qt Creator. I personally think uh, uh, the IntelliJ uh, IDEs or JetBrains IDEs like PyCharm and C Lion are pretty good as well. Uh, you might also check out other IDEs. I also use Emacs from time to time. Uh, but the point is actually, if you're working with Python and Qt Quick, uh, you should have an editor that supports Python, because else it's not fun to work with Python. Uh, you might consider using Qt Creator for just for QML and the other ID for, for Python. Uh, from a personal experience, PyCharm is really great for Python, it's not so good for QML, but I still work with it because I can, uh, for me it's more important to have a good Python editor than have a Q, uh, good QML editor, actually. Um, so the next thing I want to, uh, to, to talk about is a little bit the quality assurance and also the issues that is covered when working with uh, Qt Quick and Python. And uh, especially I think the issues are very important because like, we'll, you will definitely discover them and uh, there's a lot less documentation about this uh, in the official documentations and also in forums on the internet. So first of all, um, in our project, we discovered that it's very useful as a first level of quality assurance to actually use some tools like statics analysis or to use um, basically out, uh, like co um, a standard code format, for example. Um, if you are working with Python, there is one code format called Black, which is becoming really popular at the moment. I think it has almost 2,600 stars on GitHub or so. So it's really popular in the Python community, actually. And it enforces a specific code format, which is based on PEP8. Uh, so that's, in my opinion, also a great thing about Python. There's one uh, code standard which is recommended, actually, by, uh, officially by the Python community. Black8 is an uh, autumn formatting your code. So you actually don't have to think about the code format at all. Uh, which is really great if you're working with a, a project team, a bigger project team especially, because uh, there will be discussions about the code format, and if, especially if the people that are not working with, with Python or with uh, QML or whatever uh, all the time and, and just want to edit or write some scripts, you will have some discussions that are just unnecessary, and with an automatic code format, you can prevent those. Um, QML format is actually a tool based on the Qt Creator-based um, QML format, so in Qt Creator there's a menu option for auto-formatting your QML files. I found it to be very useful as well, especially when working not with Qt Creator, because uh, since I already mentioned the, the QML support from other editors is depending on the editor, uh, auto-formatting your code is really helpful, actually. Then we use Flake 8, which is like a static analysis tool for Python. It catches some basic errors. I really recommend you to do, use something like this. Also for C++, I mean, there's um, a thing it's called Clang, Clang something, and also Clang format for auto-formatting. Uh, definitely, you should check it out because uh, 
basic errors that uh, simple mistakes can be avoided with that. And if you're making uh, pull requests and you're reviewing code and you get finding this kind of errors that could be easily caught by something like Flake 8, it's just annoying. Uh, it's a lot easier if you just uh, catch them before actually committing your code. And that's why I'm coming to the next point, which is pre-commit. Pre-commit is actually a framework which is also coming from the Python community, but it's not only for Python, it could also be used for a C++ project or something else, actually, which um, automatically runs these tools um, when you're doing a commit, for example. You can attach it as a git hook, and when you're running git commit, it will automatically execute, for example, black QML format, flake 8, clang format, whatever you want to use. And who of you is actually using Docker for something in your uh, project? Person? Uh, so th that's what I thought, actually, because like Docker is mostly, uh, think, most of people think of Docker is very useful for web applications and, and uh, web servers and things like that. But we actually found it to be very useful as well uh, for embedded systems development or for system development or actually in general for any kind of development uh, because we can deploy our applications or tools like Black, for example, inside the Docker container and then we can use the Docker container to run our basic uh, tests beforehand. We can also use it to run unit tests or things like that. So it's actually very generally very useful to have. Uh, we found it especially useful for those people who are not uh, that experienced with, uh, with a certain programming language and so on. So in our project, we're also working with uh, mechanical engineers, and they also commit things to the project and sometimes write a few Python scripts and that, and they're not that familiar with setting up a Linux system, for example. For them, it's a lot easier to have a pre-configured Docker image where they can just run these commands or automatically run these commands and they don't have to worry about how to, do, to destroy their Linux system, basically. The next step is actually to do testing. So if you're writing Python code, I think it's twice, twice uh, as important to actually do unit testing. And I re also recommend you to do a test-driven development. So you're actually writing your tests before you're writing the code, uh, or at the same time you're writing the code. Uh, this ensures, actually it's very useful, for, first of all, for development itself, and it also ensures um, that the basic things, like for example, pa passing in some types uh, that, uh, that are wrong or things like that, that, these things are checked. So you really have some base of consistency where you can start to uh, improve on your application or work on features, and you still can make sure you're not breaking stuff because you can always run the unit tests. or uh, also, like things like high-level tests or even GUI tests, as uh, shortly explained here, um, we are using PyTest in this project. Uh, there is Python unit test. There are other uh, frameworks called uh, Nose, for example. There is uh, even something like with, uh, for behavior-driven uh, development, which is called Behave. You might want to check that out as well. I think there's even a PyTest extension for behavior-driven development. You might want to check that out. Um, PyTest is actually very cool, in my opinion, because it uh, really lowers the bar of writing uh, test codes or tests itself. Uh, from personal experience, I know uh, developers are generally very lazy, so they don't like to write test code. Um, and so it's a lot easier if you ha just have to write a couple of lines of codes. Uh, compared to have to write a complete test class or things like that. And with PyTests, uh, uh, tests basically, so this is actually the tests here. The other things is just a mock, uh, a fixture and, and uh, the Im imports. But basically, this is a test. So it's really a couple of lines of code. It's really easy to use. And the bar of writing, like the entry bar of writing a test is so, so simple or so, so low that everyone, uh, that it's a lot easier to write, that, to actually start writing the tests instead of just thinking about doing it or keeping it, pushing it to the end of the project or just avoiding it. So that's really uh, very helpful to make it as simple as possible to write tests, actually. And if, if things that do not help, so if, if testing fails, if, if, uh, if your application is doing weird things, then you might uh, start 
to debug or if you just want to uh, understand some part of the, your application. But unfortunately, if you're working with Qt, uh, Python, and C++ at the same time, it's a little bit more complex to debug things because you have things inside uh, your Python application that you want to debug. You may have things in your QML application that you want to debug, and you have things in your C++ application or yeah, some kind of uh, C++ uh, QML module that you want to debug. But actually, that's pretty easy to solve. So debugging Python applications is simple if you have a Python IDE. Uh, you can also use, of course, uh, GDB for, for this uh, purpose, so it's attached by uh, with the terminal. But um, if you are, want to debug a C++ application, uh, you have to use, for example, either Qt Creator, which is, uh, in my opinion, is also a good uh, debugger. Or, uh, for example, CLion can also um, be used for debugging C++ applications and Python applications. Uh, what you need to do is to have to attach to a process. So you have to find your Python process. Actually, um, if it's a threaded application, you might have to find a specific thread. Uh, but you just have to attach to the uh, uh, application process. And you also have to make sure you have built your QML modules, your C++ QML modules with debug info, else it will not um, output something. Uh, like, you would have to read the, the hex code or the assembly, which is not very useful in my opinion. But for some people, it might be. Or if everything fails, so, if, so for example, an application crashes at startup, uh, or if you just can't debug it if you don't have the source code for this QML module you're using, you might want to check out logging. Uh, logging can be useful as well if you just have, want to deploy your application and you can't exit it, access it to debugging and so on. So you might be familiar with lo logging already. Uh, but with Python, we have a, a specific logging module. You can either use that or you can use the, the Qt features, whatever you prefer. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the issues I discovered uh, when actually uh, working with Qt uh, and Python or Quick and Python. So the first thing is actually, uh, I took this picture from, from, from a blog. Uh, the article was called How to Not Shoot Yourself in the Foot with, with PyQt. Um, so the first thing actually, when you write the most simple, most basic uh, Hello World application with Python, and Qt, uh, it does not matter if it's a Qt quick application or Qt widget application, you will have this. This is a very basic application. You can imagine the main QML file, it's a very simple QML file, so to speak. Uh, but what will happen when you press Control C? Does anyone know what will happen? Okay, exactly that will happen. It will happen, nothing will happen. Because what's happened, what's, what's the problem here? Already mentioned it in the title, it's the, the Qt event loop is running, but our Python application never is executing. So it never gets the abort signal, so to speak. So Python is never executed, so it will not abort, which is very annoying if you have some kind of replication. Either you want to start, just stop it from the command line, or if you're actually writing a ROS um, application or something like that, you may want to uh, automatically stop it when you're stopping your ROS uh, system, a ROS master. And the simple solution for that is just spin up a timer, um, start an empty lambda, and it will work. I've heard recently, I've, I've posted this on Reddit as well, and someone from actually from the GTK, uh, PyGTK project mentioned about using a Unix socket and system uh, notifiers for solving this problem, so you can uh, actually uh, let your Qt event loop or um, notify or other way around notify your Python system and it will work instantly. But I think this is just a very simple fix uh, workaround for this problem. So yeah. Next thing is uh, especially like a lot of Python libraries like to store some object references because it's very useful. Or, or it's one way to work uh, around uh, using threads is actually do you have callbacks? Um, and so the threads is actually inside your uh, Python library. Uh, for example, if you are working with ROS in this project, uh, we are working with ROS. Uh, with ROS, by you have a published subscriber system, 
And when you're creating a subscriber, you're re registering some kind of feedback, uh, sorry, feedback callback, in this called, uh, instance called feedback received, which is executed when a message is received. But this is, the, um, call, uh, this is basically a QML uh, component uh, based on QObject called interactive marker. So we have this in our QML application. And what happens when, for example, if this is inside a loader class or if is, this is inside uh, your application and you're closing this window. So since uh, Qt, so first of all, what happens? You will get an error message, uh, which says something like QObject does not exist or something like that. So first of all, you will start to wonder why does, does my QObject not exist anymore? But the reason for that is uh, Qt has its own uh, memory management system, so to speak, which is based on parent-child relationship. And so when you're cleaning up a parent, uh, it cleans all those child references. So that's why we're registering with the parent. Uh, but the point is Python has a garbage, uh, uh, uses a garbage collector. So it basically have a, has a different kind of uh, memory management uh, system, uh, which does not care about what we're doing in Qt. So when we're actually cleaning up a uh, Qt uh, reference, we also need to clean up our um, Python object. And for this purpose, it's pretty easy to solve. We just connect to our destroyed signal from the Q object. Uh, we are connecting a lambda, which unregisters unregist in this case our callback. Depending on your Python library, you might uh, delete the reference, delete the Python object, of, or um, depending, yeah, it really depends on your actual application, what you need to do. But important to, to note here is that if you are using uh, something that stores a reference to a Python object, uh, which is also a queue object at the same time, you need to clean up the Python object separately. If you forget that, you got a lot of error messages. In the worst case, your application might crash. Um, so this is very uh, untu unintuitive, actually. So uh, when you're uh, having a QML um, component and you're passing in some value, this is automatically converted in Python to a Python type. For example, uh, you have uh, a double inside of GML. It will com com uh, convert it to a, a Python float, which is straightforward, actually. But uh, and if it's a string, a Q string, which is coming from JavaScript, for example, it's converted to a Python string. But if you have a Q variant, um, you would expect, actually, like in C++, you're probably also getting a variant. You would expect it to automatically convert either to the right type, which sometimes works. So Q variant can be automatically converted to some Python type. Uh, but for some reason, it does not work, or the conversion is actually creating a Q JavaScript value if you're passing in, uh, like here, for example, a list. I think also when you're using a JavaScript object, the same will happen. But I'm not sure what it would uh, convert it to in, in Python, like maybe a dictionary, but uh, never seen that working. Uh, but basically here in this particular example, we're having a list uh, which we're passing in uh, via uh, QML. And inside our uh, actual Python function, we are expecting a Q variant because, yeah, our property is a Q variant property, but we are actually getting a Q JavaScript value. And to choose your Q JavaScript value can be converted to a Q variant. Very unintuitive. Uh, first of all, you will first see this Q JavaScript value and you don't know uh, where it's coming from. But the really big problem is when you're doing, uh, creating, writing the unit test for this particular function, you actually want to pass in a Python list and not a JavaScript value. So a, a workaround for this is just to check if it's an instance of good JavaScript value, then we're converting to variant. If it's not, we're using the value as is, and then it's automatically converted to a Python list. There are some other problems that is covered. So actually, one of the big problems in, in QML actually is uh, or with the Python bindings, or probably with other, any other kind of uh, language bindings, so to speak, is that there's a fixed, hard-coded 
QML type limit. I haven't thought about that. Uh, I never thought it would, uh, that would be the case, but you're never seeing it in C++ uh, because it's uh, only relevant for the, the Python bindings or whatever kind of uh, language bindings that are not compiled. Um, it's hard-coded in the source code. Uh, the PyQt version looks very interesting. It's just a copy and paste 60 times. Um, the Qt for Python uh, PySide um, version looks a little bit nicer. It's, I think it uses some uh, macro and template magic. Uh, but basically, it just, uh, just registers 60, or I think it's different for, for PySide and or Qt for Python and PyQt. But it registers 60 default types. I think they're called like uh, QML object one, two, three, four, I don't know, something like this. Um, or QML type one, two, three, four, or something like this. And then there, uh, there's a map inside which matches them to the actual QML type. And um, there's unfortunately no easy workaround for this. I have, I have created a, an issue uh, in the Qt uh, bug tracker. Uh, so we probably will have this problem in the future as well. Uh, I increased it in my application to 120. It works out for me at the moment. But of course, if you're writing bigger applications, we'll quickly see uh, this number can be a problem. And I hope in Qt 6 or something, uh, they will clean it up to maybe make the uh, Qt, uh, the QML type system uh, more adaptable for more types or dynamically uh, sizing. Um, then there are bugs uh, or issues that are present in PySide and some that are, uh, are present in PyQt, which is a little bit um, annoying, actually, um, because in this particular case, we can't use Qt for Python at the moment because there are things like QML register single to type is not existent. And I use that, for example, for uh, the config, uh, like a global config uh, object, single to type. And in PyQt, QValidator, QQuit item, and so on, if you inherit ends from these object types that are not simple Q objects, uh, you get a sec fault. I've actually reported this bug. It might be fixed in the near future, but right at the moment, it's not working. Um, it's just a little bit of annoyance as you will have when working with Python and Qt. You will discover these problems when you're actually working on an application. Um, just expect that things like that will happen. There might be a solution or might not. Uh, just ask in some kind of, in, in, for example, in the PyQt mailing list or uh, search on a Qt bug tracker. Uh, something that also annoys me a little bit is the boilerplate code. Um, so when you're writing a Qt uh, C++ application and you're creating properties, you have, uh, in C++ it's pretty normal to use getters and setters. In Python it's usually not, uh, not normal to, to write getters and setters if you don't need to. So if you, there, uh, Python supports properties natively, and you might want to use setters and getters in some cases, but not in all cases, but you always have to do that when you want to create a Python uh, property that is also a QML, a uh, Qt property. And that just uh, adds a lot of code to your actual application. So if you have 10 properties, you will have like 200 lines of code that's nothing else than just setting and getting your, uh, your member variable or something like that. It's very annoying. It's, in my opinion, not very Pythonic. So it's the completely opposite you would expect when working with Python, actually. Then there's the, I think it's not a problem. It's just an inconvenience. Uh, so, uh, Qt uh, uh, by default has a camel case style. Uh, if you're working with Qt Quick and, and QML, it's also camel case, but uh, Python has by default snake casing. So most of the Python libraries have snake case um, naming, but our C++ application the Qt APIs have camel case naming. Uh, not a problem if you're just using the Qt uh, libraries, but if you're creating your own uh, QML uh, components, uh, it can be very annoying to decide if you want to use snake case for your function name or if you want to use camel case or if you want to mix them. Uh, it's just, you have to wrap your head around that and you have to decide on one st a particular style, but it's, um, you can't freely decide because the functions or actually the um, decorators in Python uh, for properties, for example, don't support uh, that you can convert them.
So, uh, last but not least, uh, I will tell you about my conclusion. You have seen there uh, a lot of things that are work really nicely with, uh, with Qt for Python or really great, but there are other things that look like uh, make your life as a uh, Qt for Python developer a little bit hard at the moment at least. And so I will uh, come to my final conclusion, which actually is uh, try out Qt for Python or PyQt, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, and see if it works for your application. So if you, are have, uh, if you are starting to think about creating a new project, try it out, see if it works for you. If you really like, if you are already familiar with Python, you might, uh, it might be even e easier to start for you. Um, if you are starting a new project and you have not decided yet, you want to try it. Um, but if you are creating, for example, a mobile application, or if you're creating maybe a Qt for WebAssembly application, if you're targeting this platform or want to target it in a short future, you might better be off by using C++. And most importantly, don't misuse Python for things like uh, applications that need um, high, have a high throughput or uh, need some algorithmical performance and so on. I mean, ca uh, Python can be used for uh, mathematics, for example, if you use NumPy. But in this case, actually, you're outsourcing the calculations and the matrix conversions or whatever you might want to do to the C++ uh, or C bindings, uh, C backend of the, of the libraries. So if you use it right, Python can be relatively performant. And it's most certainly, it's a lot easier to use, uh, especially um, for Things like prototyping, of course, I already mentioned. Things like user interfaces are actually great. If you are creating a user interface for an, a specific target, an embedded device, maybe a desktop device, um, then try out Qt for Python. If you are creating a cross-platform cross application, we might be better off using Qt Creator, uh, sorry, Qt C++ because Qt Creator just supports all platforms. It's just a matter of pressing a button to deploy everything. We'll not get this experience with Qt for Python. And in the near future, I hope a lot of these problems that I have mentioned here, issues, will clear. Uh, so hope they will be um, fixed in, in either in Qt or in Qt for Python bindings. And it will be a lot less frustra frustrating to get started with. Um, I also think there is a lot of documentation missing at the moment. I'm writing. Uh, blog posts from time to time, uh, maybe talking about uh, some issues like here. I hope there will be uh, more things added to the official Qt documentations. And in general, I hope that, that Qt and Python in combination will be uh, even better in the future and will probably draw also more people to Qt itself. Because I think there's a lot, uh, like, or actually there are a lot of Python developers out there which currently have not a good choice or not a really good choice for a graphical framework. So if you're thinking um, a little bit about Python itself and then uh, ecosystem and everything, there is uh, a couple of uh, GUI interface fra uh, framework choices, but I think there's no uh, choice that is as good as, uh, as Qt. Uh, I personally really like Qt and working with Qt, and uh, I think the, that the Python developers and also uh, C++ developers should be able uh, to use uh, Python and Qt together more easily and more frequent in the future. Yeah, if you want to have some more information, as I already mentioned on my blog, machinecoder.com, you will find uh, some articles like, for example, how to not shoot yourself in the foot with PyQt, and also a comparison of PyQt and uh, Qt for Python. And on my GitHub repository, you probably also find some uh, very specific uh, things like live coding for Qt and C++ and Qt and uh, Python. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, too. <laughs> Any questions? No, OK. No questions? No, yeah. So you mentioned uh, Docker as a tool uh, to ease uh, the development, uh, especially for uh, non-expert users. Can you um, explain a, a little bit more um, if uh, is, uh, this fits also for Python tools as well? 
Yes. Okay. So um, in general, uh, we 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 are actually started to use Docker uh, because our, our setup is very uh, complex uh, with ROS itself. ROS, uh, if if some of you who who knows ROS. Okay, one. So you probably know it's very complex setup. It's really a lot of, um, if you don't using the packages that come with your Linux system, it's a lot of time to compile everything and so on. So that's why we actually started using Docker. But uh, it turned out to be actually very useful also for development, not only for deploying the application, but also for development. So we're actually setting up a Docker container, for example, with an Ubuntu system or a Debian system as base. We're installing the basic tools that you need for uh, development or the, the tools that you need for uh, checking your code, like Black, for example, in this case, or uh, Flag 8. So these are hosted inside your uh, Docker container. And then we're using this, first of all, we're using it really for development. Uh, if you know how, you can actually use, uh, uh, run GUI applications inside your Docker container, which is very useful. I think, um, I'm not sure if someone in, in the cute uh, blog already mentioned it, but, but uh, there are actually some examples out there uh, for how to do that. And uh, first of all, that's useful in itself, but it's also useful to use the Docker container just to run some specific tools because the Docker container is a lot more lightweight than, uh, than, than a virtual machine. So it's, uh, spinning it up, for, for example, just to run Plaq is pretty simple. It's just spinning up the container. It takes less than a second, depending on, on, on your computer. Uh, and then you can just kind of run the, the tool, get the results, and the Docker container is shut down again. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Any other question? Oh, no. I think we're done. Thanks again, Alexander. Okay. Thank you very much.